Hi friends, my name is Angela and welcome back to my channel where we talk all about books and a little bit of life peppered in here and there. Today we're going to have a little bit of a bookish catch up, bookish chat. So curl up, put a blanket over your lap, get a drink into your hand and let's get chatting. I'm reading a lot of books at the moment, which I am so, so grateful for after what felt like such a drought over the last couple of months. And I've, I've finished a couple this month. I've got a few on the go right now. But I want to wait until the end of the month to share them with you. I really love my monthly wrap ups and I'm kind of in two minds about whether I want to share books with you as I finish them or wait until the end of the month and do a wrap up of all of the books. So if you have an opinion either way, please let me know below if you want me to just do like a end of the month wrap up or if you would like me to share with them with you as I go along. I'd love to hear your thoughts about it below. To be honest, much of my time lately, other than reading books, has been dedicated to updating one of our guest rooms. I've been doing a lot of interior decorating. I'm on a time crunch because it has to be ready for Christmas. And it's, so we're updating it to uh, have two single beds in there. It's kind of turning into the grandkids room and which I don't mind, but I don't want it to be a kiddie room. I've been spending a lot of time being very purposeful, trying to decorate it in a way that you could have you know, two people sleep in there that aren't a couple, but they're not children, but also have kids be very comfortable in there and be like, kids, go down to that room and just hang out down there and get out of our hair for a bit. If I'm not too embarrassed, I may share, share like a little bit of a mood board peek of where I've kind of gone with the concept so you can kind of see it. And I'm really pleased with it. I'm really happy with how it's coming together. So while I don't want it to be entirely childlike in there, I am excited for a little bit of a project where I'm going to be buying some new children's books that I will put in there. I think I will house my children book collection in that room. You know, these books I've been reading lately, like The Secret Garden and Tom Sawyer and Charlotte's Web, they'll be housed in there. But I do have a gap where I need to find some books that are appropriate for children like age five to 10. Hardback books, picture books. I'm going to definitely build out my children's library collection over the next few months. Probably be hitting up some secondhand bookstores for those. And I'm excited to do that. Most of the children's books we have, ages one through to five, six, seven, are books that were from my childhood or my husband's childhood. So they are very, very old. And while my grandson enjoys them, and they are very age appropriate still, there are some that are not. There is one book which I'm going to get. This book, The Min Pins from Roald Dahl, I have never read to my grandson. I don't, don't know if I will, but there is a lot of, there's a lot of words. So he's, he's only five now. And Roald Dahl, I don't know what you were thinking. But it starts off with this story about Little Billy's mother was always telling him exactly what he was allowed to do and not allowed to do. All the things he was allowed to do were boring and all the things he was not allowed to do were exciting. And one of the things he was never allowed to do was go out the garden gate by himself and explore the world. Little Billy was tired of being very good. And then through the window, not so very far away, he could see the big black secret wood called the Forest of Sin. It was something he always longed to explore. And I was like... What? I'm not reading that to my grandson, so I think maybe I need to read it. But then further on, little Billy began to hear somebody whispering in his ear. He knew exactly who it was. It was the devil. The devil always started whispering to him when he was especially bored. It would be easy, the devil was whispering, to climb out through that window. No one would see you. What? <laughs> so, so anyway, I need to get a few more books. It, I mean... I must have read this, but it is in very good conditions, so and maybe I didn't read it all that much. Anyway, I need to buy some new children's books for this room, and I might have to just like keep this. I might be doing a censorship in my own house, which I am ashamed of, but uh, after my conversation in my last, one of my last videos about book censorship, I'm a little ashamed to admit that, but please, please tell me I am not wrong to be maybe holding this aside for a number of years from my grandchildren. <laughs> Roald Dahl. What's that man thinking? At the time this video comes out, the Booker Prize winner may have been announced. I, I can't, I don't know what the time zone conversion is for me in Australia, but I will wake up at one point this week and the winner will be announced. So I have read James, 
And I am in the process of reading Stoneyard Devotional. I am enjoying Stoneyard Devotional. I have not, I could not put one above the other just yet, but it was interesting when I shared with you that I was reading both of those books that so many of you, so many of you said that you would love Stoneyard Devotional to take out the top prize. So that was really, really interesting. But they are the only two books that I'm reading off the shortlist and Charlotte Wood's writing is just so lovely. I did read one of her books a couple of years ago. It was a very beautiful little book called The Weekend and it's about, it was about three women who uh, their fourth friend had passed away and at Christmas they have gone to their friend's house to pack the house down and it was a beautiful little story of these different characters coming together and I really did enjoy it. I gave it to my mum who has then passed it on to a number of her friends and Stoneyard Devotional has really hit a number of notes for me as well. She has a way of writing that all of a sudden you'll be reading something and she just clocks you on the head with this truth of normalcy. There is something to it that you just, it's like you've known about it, but you haven't quite put words to it. And there was something I read this morning where she was talking about, uh, there was a passage in here where the narrator is talking about a girl she knew and she was talking about this girl's mother. She was the only mother we ever saw catch the school bus. And this was a degrading sight. Watching the girl's mother climbing the bus stairs with her bags of groceries was like seeing someone naked. And it's just like, I don't know, from a child's perspective, I completely understood that statement. I completely understood it. And Charlotte Wood has just such a wonderful way with words that it's uncomplicated, it is brief, it is poetic. It is like reading a little bit of poetry in this book. There are so many moments where it could be a book of poetry. Anyway, I'm, I'm maybe halfway, almost halfway through it at the moment. And there's definitely some laughing moments in here. There are some tender moments in here. I'm hoping to read it by the end of the week, but later on I'll share with you my current reads and I will show you the book that has pushed Stoneyard Devotional down my list at the moment. Over the last couple of months, we've had a number of new people joining me here and I thought it might be fun for me to share a little bit more about myself. So I'm going to do this little tag I kind of came across. It might have been a blog tag, not so much a YouTube tag. And it's called Currently I'm. And so it's just like currently I'm reading, watching, listening, eating, cooking, buying things. So it's just a little bit of what is going on in my life right now. And maybe there'll be something in here that inspires you, a little recommendation. So first of all, the thing that you've probably come here for is what I am currently reading. Of course, Stoneyard Devotional. So I started reading this last weekend. I picked it up after I finished reading James. And like I said, I am partway through it. I am constantly, constantly uh, taking record of little snippets of passages to remember. This book has a lot of elements of grief in it. And I don't think that I am yet really into the depths of what that grief is for this character. But there is one particular moment in this book where she talks about grief and that feeling of grief. Walking back to the car, I remembered something else. A phone call many months after my mother's death. A man's voice quietly telling me her headstone was ready. I recall standing by the laundry door with the phone in my hand, my outsides unaltered by... My outsides unaltered, but everything within me plummeting, like sand... I don't think I can get through this without crying. I recall standing by the laundry door with the phone in my hand, my outsides unaltered, but everything within me plummeting, like a sandbank collapsing inside me. And just that visual of that feeling of a sandbank inside of you just collapsing, that moment of, um, I don't know if it is a moment of grief, it is just a moment of that shock and that, oh, the way, her way with words is just incredible. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It is incredibly poetic. There are so many moments I want to take a snapshot of and remember and write down and grip onto. So I'm enjoying that one. But I do, I, I feel, whereas James, I, I really did race through it because it was such an adventure. This one I'm really taking my time with. It is, it is a little bit different. It is something that I want to kind of slowly meander through and just experience a little bit differently. So I'm really, really enjoying that one. But when I started reading, I started reading Charlotte, I started reading Stoneyard Devotional and then I went into a bookstore and I came across this other book and it totally, I was like, 
I need to read that book right now. And that book was Once Upon a River from Diane Setterfield. And so I've started reading this book and it's kind of pushed Stoneyard devotional down. Like I said, there's no great urgency to the narration or to the narrative in Stoneyard devotional. It's not like I feel like I need to get into it to read the story, to find the outcome. To it, it doesn't feel that way, but it is a story I want to know. I want to finish it. Whereas this one, I'm like, there is something here that I really, really want to experience. So one of the reasons why I picked this particular book up is because on the front, it has a quote from Madeline, or not on the front, sorry, on the back, it has a quote from Madeline Miller, swift and entrancing, profound and beautiful. Give yourself a treat and read it. Yes, Madeline, I will do anything you ever, ever, ever say. And another one infused with the spirit of Jane Eyre, Rebecca and the woman in white from The Independent. And then in like the first, there's like page after page at the start of just like these little quotes from different people and newspapers. The entire quote from Madeline Miller reads, Once Upon a River is one of the most pleasurable and satisfying new books I've read in a long time. Setterfield is a master, master storyteller, her language flowing with a dark magic, very like the river at the heart of her tale. Swift and entrancing, profound and beautiful. Give yourself a treat and read it. And then there's another quote from uh, M.L. Steadman, who wrote The Light Between Oceans, Ruth Hogan from the keep, the author of The Keeper of Lost Things. There are some, there's some serious gravitas of these people who are writing recommendations to read this book. So I was like, yes, I will read this book. And I am gripped. This book is laden with historical fiction, with magic, with humor with it's just got so much so let me tell you a little bit about it it was published a couple of years ago 2018 and this is the synopsis it was the longest night of the year when the strangest of things happened in an ancient inn on the thames the regulars are entertaining themselves by telling stories when the door bursts open and in steps an injured stranger in his arms is the drowned corpse of a child hours later the dead girl stirs takes a breath and returns to life is it a miracle is it magic and who does the little girl belong to? An exquisitely crafted, multi-layered mystery brimming with storytelling and the urgent scientific curiosity of the Darwinian age, Once Upon a River is as richly atmospheric as Setterfield's bestseller, The Thirteenth Tale. I have not read anything by Anne Setterf Diane Setterfield before, but this is really, really interesting. It is so engaging. It is so captivating. The writing is very interesting. I'm really, really enjoying it and it, to the point where I don't want to read anything else but this book. But I've got a number of books I want to read this month and we're halfway through. So this is something else that I'm currently reading right now and I am loving it. I also finally got hold of my hard copy of The Well-Gardened Mind from Sue Stewart-Smith and I'm about five or six chapters in. I'm really enjoying it. I'm really enjoying seeing the connection between nature and mental health and it's not just about uh, it's not just about depression there is connections between uh, people that have actual serious mental illness such as schizophrenia and how nature can help them and I'm, I'm finding it very very interesting it is so well laid out so well researched it's not too complicated it's not too scientific it's not giving you too much information but there is a lot that I want to try and digest so I do feel like this is probably something I'll be rereading and making lots of notes on again in the future and especially because I started listening to it on audiobook I may go back and reread a little bit to, to be able to make notes on those things that initially I heard and I wasn't able to make notes about so that's something else that I currently have on the go and that's the only book that I said I wanted to read for Nonfiction November that I actually have on the go for Nonfiction November. The other one that I do have on the go that was not on my list of books that I wanted to read is Recipes for a Kinder Life from Annie Smithers. Now, a while ago, I shared with you a book that was on my radar that I wanted to read, and it was a book from Annie Smithers called Kitchen Sentimental. And I was hesitant to buy it because I thought it was going to be very, very similar to a book that I had just bought from Nigel Slater called A Thousand Feasts. I was in the bookstore. I saw Kitchen Sentimental. This was right next to it, and I put this on my virtual bookshelf a long long time ago totally didn't realize that Annie Smithers was Australian and anyway I thought why not because I hadn't seen it on an actual book 
store shelf before. My understanding of Annie Smithers is that she is a real pioneer of the paddock to plate movement. She is a farmer, she is a chef, and this particular book I think is about her journey of how going from maybe the city to the country and how it has provided a gentler life and a much kinder life for her. I'm really interested in reading that. I think what why wouldn't you want a kind of life? So there'll be, there actually are recipes in here, I understand, but this is a little bit about it. In this generous account of life on the land and in the kitchen, trailblazing cook Annie Smithers chronicles her quest for a more sustainable existence in harmony with the environment and herself. Part meditation, part memoir, the book offers practical advice and wisdom gleaned from a life dedicated to seasonal food and living lightly on the ground beneath her feet. Recipe for a Kinder Life offers a guiding hand for anyone, from the city to the regions, who yearns to live more gently. It's about caring for land and reaping the bounty. But at its heart, it reveals the key to living a sustainable life is finding the best way to sustain yourself. So that was something I really wanted for a while. I've only just like started reading it like within the first few pages but that is something else that I'm currently reading and then two other books which I mean I am reading them because I am sitting down spending a lot of time with them but they're not book books Paul Bangay's Guide to Plants I got this a long time ago and I really liked this because it's a bit like an encyclopedia of plants but they are plants that really do suit the Australian climate and Paul Bangay is a very famous Australian landscaper this book contains a lot of the plants and species that he is well known for landscaping with and it's something that I, we've, we've come into spring, we're coming into summer here in Australia and we're constantly coming through droughts and water restrictions and watching plants struggle and it's just something that I'm thinking more of is about how I can make my garden much more drought tolerant make it beautiful without me being out there watering every day so I really am I've been looking through this with a fine tooth comb trying to think of what plants I can be putting into my garden to make it beautiful but and also drought tolerant and sustainable so this has been a really great book I would recommend it you don't have to be Australian a lot of these plants uh, transfer to other regions and I'm also looking through this one to get a little bit of inspiration, I guess, on just landscaping and how things can look so beautiful and still be really, whether it's productive or just sustainable and resistant to disease or drought, I'm really looking for that in our garden. So this one is uh, from Country Style, which is a magazine in Australia. And these are just, this is just pictures of a number of different houses that they have photographed in the past and their gardens in particular. And it just, yeah, it just takes you through their gardens and some different landscaping ideas. It gives you a little bit of information about the uh, plants that they've put in. I think they're really, it's really quite beautiful just to flip through. So I'm, in, I'm enjoying that. So there's Definitely something I'm spending quite a bit of my time in these two books. Uh, so currently I'm watching, well I just finished just last night, a my very first Korean drama which was called Queen of Tears and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Every episode was an hour and a half long which was insane and there was 16 episodes but it was my first Korean drama. I had never done one before. I don't know what I expected from it. It goes through it goes through the seasons. It starts off in spring. It visually you see the seasons changing and it goes through into winter and there's some beautiful winter scenery and then it comes through to spring again. The story follows uh, a woman named Hagin who is in a, she's in a family, a conglomerate family. They own the department store in, in Seoul. Her grandfather started this store and she is now the CEO. So we're following her. That's where the, the queen comes from. The name of the store is Queens. And she's married to a man named Bak Hanwu. I forgive me if I pronounce these names wrong and they were they've been married for three years and he is from a very different background than her he was brought up in a rural area and her, his parents are farmers they are very different and they fell in love kind of like 
he didn't realize who she was when they fell in love and he, but he loved her and so they got married and so we we're, we're 3 years after they've been married and they are not going well. He is on the brink of asking for a divorce. At the end of the first episode, Hayen receives some devastating information which changes the trajectory of their relationship. And it is just so, such an incredible show. It is so beautifully shot. It is, the cinematography is beautiful. The actors are incredible. They are beautiful people. The way that they photograph these people is incredible. Um, there's a lot of humour. I really enjoyed watching the family of Beck, Beck Hun Wu. His family were quite funny. And the people that were the villains were awful. You really hated them. It kind of gave you everything. And it wasn't, I guess the Korean dramas, I kind of always thought that maybe they were overly sickly sweet. It was very romance driven. And there is a little bit of romance in this, but it's not the only thing in there. It was very beautifully done. I fully loved it. It's probably up there as one of my favorite television shows this year. So Queen of Tears, please watch it, especially if you haven't watched a Korean drama before. I Give it a go. You can watch it with, with English dubbing if you want. You don't have to watch it with subtitles. It, it was so well done and it will grip you there. It has a bit of everything. It has a bit of action. It has romance. It has drama, humor, comedy, so, so well done. And it goes through all the seasons, like I said. So I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So now I need to find something new to watch. So if you have any recommendations, please let me know. I'm not sure what to watch. I was thinking of maybe Rivals, which I think is based on Jilly Cooper novels, a novel. So if you have any recommendations, please let me know. I really want to watch another Korean drama. My Netflix algorithm has gone bananas. Everything, my entire, like, algorithm is now just Korean drama everywhere so so I need to watch something else to just balance it out a little bit maybe I'll, I don't know maybe I will watch another one okay currently I'm listening to uh, to be honest at the moment I am just asking Google to play a song and just seeing where that takes us which usually works out pretty well I'm pretty happy with how that works with Spotify just playing a single song and just going with it as we move into the warmer weather here in Australia I definitely lean into like a bit of easy 70s kind of music you know like Fleetwood Mac Little River band in Australia and that kind of stuff just I don't know I, I kind of like that it fits really well to just pottering around the house doing some housework and gardening I also I do have like a playlist that I made which is called jazz for warm days which I have on repeat and that has things like old Cape Cod and you know a bit of Ella Fitzgerald and that kind of stuff, you know, just the typical kind of things. I do need to listen to Crowded House's latest album because we are going to the Crowded House concert in Perth at the end of the month. So I need to brush up on some of their newer music. I loved, like if I listen to Crowded House, I will listen to the music they would have produced in the 90s, but I need to listen to some of their newer music. So that's something I do need to listen to this month. But as soon as it is the 1st of December, Christmas music will be being played. Absolutely. The 1st of December. I'm not allowed to play it before the 1st of December. Currently, I am cooking chocolate brownies. I've been making brownies with my grandson and then he ate them all and took them all. So I had to make more brownies for my husband. I've been learning to make smash burgers. I've been, I'm going to, I've decided I'm going to perfect that over this summer. And I think I've already got it down. I found the perfect bun figured out how to do it. I just did it on the barbecue outside yesterday, which was really good. So smash burgers, I've been doing those, which is so easy to do. I made for the first time a couple of months ago, rigatoni alla vodka. It was quite a viral moment, I think, this alla vodka pasta. I had uh, some family coming to stay and I wanted to do something that was relatively easy and but impressive. And so I, I came across, I found a recipe and I made that and it was incredible. So now I make it probably weekly, usually like on a Saturday night. So it feels very indulgent. We don't eat a lot of pasta during, we don't eat pasta during the week. The recipe I got was from Bon Appetit and it uses a tube of tomato puree as opposed to cans or tins of tomato. And it is so, so good. It was surprising that you would think the vodka would just, you wouldn't get any flavor from it because vodka really doesn't have a smell or a 
much of a taste but you do get a real warmth from it that was really really good I'm enjoying that so I'll, I'll leave a link to that recipe below if you want to try it out it's from Bon, bon Appetit currently I'm eating well brownies panettone panettone or panettone in the lead up to Christmas in Australia the supermarkets go heavy on the panettone Italian Christmas cakes and I'm really enjoying the ones that I'm getting from the local supermarket. There are some from Woolworths. There's just like a, just a clean vanilla one that I really, really love. I don't actually think it's a panettone. It's called a pandoro because it doesn't have any of the dried fruit in there. But this is delicious. It's just like a vanilla cake. And you just, this is supposed to be like for one person, this serve. But it is so delicious. And just like dip it in coffee or whatever. And it's only $5. I thought it was a really good buy. But if you get the big version of it, which I think I might do for Christmas, so I've got it here if we have people over, the big version is like this big and it comes with ice and sugar and you put the ice and sugar in this bag and you shake it all around and so then it comes, it's all like got this powdered ice and sugar all over it and I think I might get that too. But the panettone ones are delicious with like orange peel and dried fruit in it. I'm not a big fan of you know Christmas fruit cake but that one I really do like and you can get different types as well chocolate and pear choc chip pistachio there's so many types but these ones I'm just getting from Woolworths are really nice currently I'm drinking matcha there are so many health benefits to matcha tea and I love that I really do love it and I usually will drink like a matcha latte and I'll have it with almond milk but I'm trying to cut down on the almond milk. I now drink my coffee black if I'm drinking at home and I would much rather do that with matcha if I could. But matcha is, can be very, very strong. So there are different types of matcha that you would have as a cold brew or as a hot drink. And so I just bought some matcha tea which is designed for cold brew which is the one I made today. And this was delicious. This was really, really good. So I'll leave a link below. I mean, there it's an Australian company. I think it's called Zen Wonders and but I really liked it I just we I showed you how I made it <laughs> if I can make it anyone can and it's probably completely incorrect but we're off to Japan in next year and I'm hoping that I'll be able to take part in a traditional uh, tea ceremony so I'll be able to actually learn from the experts in how to do it but yeah it's really good and it's the health benefits are supposed to be amazing so I'm trying to have like maybe a coffee if I'm working from home or at home I'll have a coffee black coffee and then maybe like a matcha later in the morning or in the afternoon currently i'm buying buying i'm buying i'm buying so much stuff we don't have thanksgiving in australia but in the last five or so years australia has definitely caught on to the black friday sales so we are like we are heavily promoted with these black friday sales traditionally in australia our sales are usually after christmas day so we have what are called boxing day sales so we have Christmas Day and then the day after Christmas is sale day. But now we're getting like all of November is Black Friday sales. And I really hate it because it's one of those, I don't know if this happens in America, but it feels like the entire month of November is just sale, 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 sale. And you don't know if you buy on one day and then the next day will actually be like a better sale and then the next day and then the next day. Or will Cyber Monday be the best sale? So it just drives me crazy. I have been buying a lot of things for the guest room that we have been doing. I've had been, you know, having to buy uh, two of everything because we bought single beds. So single beds, I've got to buy. I still got to buy two mattresses, linens, quilts, pillows. I've still got to get. I've still got to buy the paint and do the painting lighting that sort of stuff um but so i've been buying a lot of stuff for that bedroom i have bought a few books which i'll share with you now the first one i got was huckleberry finn the adventures of huckleberry huckleberry finn i could not not get this after reading james i am really interested to experience this after having read james and to understand how it might have felt reading james having read this first i actually think reading James without having read this would have I think it might have given me a better experience I prob I'm probably going into this a little bit biased now but I'm looking forward to reading it most definitely I really did enjoy reading Tom Sawyer The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn I'm going to be reading this summer most definitely so I finally got hold of that 
It's very hard to find the right edition. That's the problem with these classics. There's so many choices of the editions, but I finally got one. I also got hold of a copy of Limber Lost from Robbie Arnott. I shared with you that I read Dusk, which I loved, and I wanted to read another Robbie Arnott, and so I decided to go with Limber Lost, which is most definitely one of his most popular ones. I have picked this up before and I read the first page in a bookstore and just went, whoa, it sounds very, very magical. But I'm not afraid anymore of Robbie Arnott's writing. I am not afraid. I'm going to give it a go. It's quite slight, 225 pages. In the heat of a long summer, Ned hunts rabbits in a river valley, hoping the pelts will earn him enough money to buy a small boat. His two brothers are away at war, their whereabouts unknown. His father and older si sister struggle to hold things together on the family orchard Limberlost. Desperate to ignore it all, to avoid the future rushing towards him, Ned dreams of open water. As his story unfolds over the following decades, we see how Ned's choices that summer come to shape the course of his life, the fate of his family, the future of the valley, with its seasons of death and rebirth. The third novel by the author of Flames and the Rain Heron, Limber Lost, is an extraordinary chronicle of life and land, of carnage and kindness, blood ties and love. So it'll be another summer read, most definitely. Um, but look at all these little awards on here. So that was another one I got. And this was a little one that I found in a secondhand store, which I was very pleased to get. And when I saw it, I had to get it. This is Red Dog from Louis de Bernier. De Bernier? De Berniers? This is the story of Red Dog, which is an infamous dog from the northwest of Western Australia. I did a video a little while ago. I think it might have been my, my Q&A video after I hit a thousand subscribers and I shared with you a little bit about where I was born, where I grew up and someone asked the question about um, you know a little bit about that and I shared the movie Red Dog is probably a movie that is the closest to show what it looked like where I grew up and then that movie was based on this book and Red Dog is a true, it's a real, Red Dog was a real dog, not a real person, a real dog. And Red Dog is infamous in the Northwest. Everyone knows who Red Dog is, whether you were around in the 70s or not. People know who that dog was. And this is the story of Red Dog. This is what the story is. In early 1998, I went to Perth in Western Australia in order to attend the Literature Festival. And part of the arrangement was that I should go to Caratha to do their first ever literary dinner. Caratha is a mining town a long way further north. The landscape is extraordinary, being composed of vast heaps of dark red earth and rock poking out of the never-ending bush. I imagine that Mars must have a similar feel to it. I went exploring and discovered the bronze statue to Red Dog outside the town of Dampier. I felt straight away that I had to find out more about this splendid dog. A few months later, I returned to Western Australia and spent two glorious weeks driving around collecting Red Dog stories and visiting the places that he knew, writing up the text as I went along. I hope my cat never finds out that I have written a story to celebrate the life of a dog. Louis de Bernier wrote Captain Corelli's Mandarin. He's quite an incredible writer. And there's this little teeny tiny book that he wrote about Red Dog, this teeny little dog from the northwest of Western Australia, one of the most remotest locations in the world. I saw this copy. I thought I'm never probably never going to find this copy again so I grabbed this one as well and it's so sweet it's actually got some little illustrations in there as well it's a really delightful little book Look how beautiful Look at the artwork in there so those are some things that I have bought so my books were <laughs> for once my books were not the most expensive thing I bought this month the bedroom I've been doing have been the, that's been the most expensive but that is kind of what I've been, that's, what, that's what's been going on lately. I've been watching Korean dramas and designing bedrooms and reading a lot of books. And this has been a good month. This has been a good month, friends. And I hope you are in a similar position. I hope you are having a great month wherever you are, whatever you are doing. I hope you are having a good, good month. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. I love talking with you, I love hanging out with you and just chatting about books and being all nerdy like that. So thank you so much and I will talk with you again soon. Bye.